Hi, and welcome to a follow-on video on uh, active learning. So in the previous video, I talked a bit about what active learning was and, and how you can engage in some strategies for it. Uh, and so in this video, I'm going to elaborate on a couple of more ideas and then uh, talk a bit more about uh, how active learning actually saves you time in the long run. Uh, so one thing I do want to mention is, is um, if you're doing active learning in the context of math, uh, and mathematics is certainly an area where a lot of people seem to struggle, and, and I think it's, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, for good reason, I think it's, it's, it's certainly more difficult in, in some regards. And, and, uh, and I shouldn't say more difficult, but I think it's often not taught in the most optimal way. And, it, and the actual way to do good at math and become good at mathematics uh, is a bit less intuitive compared to, to other subjects. And, and in math specifically, if you are trying to become good at math, uh, the key to becoming good at math is simply to do a lot of problems. Um, so do lots of problems. And that's a form of active learning. And keep in mind that um, when you have a test in math, Typically, the, t the test is going to involve you being able to solve uh, problems. Uh, and you might think you understand a concept, but you'll find out for sure whether you understand it or not when you actually try to solve a problem associated with that concept. And, and what will often happen is that um, you may have a lot of gaps in your understanding. And, and trying to do problems is a great way to unearth those gaps. Uh, if you are reading through an example problem, let's say you're reading your textbook and it's, uh, you see an example problem or a theorem with a proof, Try to cover up the solution and try to work it out on your own. If you get stuck, then you can read a bit of the solution for a hint and then try to keep on forging ahead. Uh, and keep reading you know, as, as much as you need to to actually get through the whole solution. And, and little by little, um, as you get stuck, read more and more of the solution until you actually have worked out the answer. Uh, if you were unable to get the answer without one or more hints, you should ask yourself uh, afterwards what might have prevented you from, from being able to come up with the answer now that you actually see the answer in your textbook. Uh, you can ask whether or not there is some way you should have thought about the problem that would have led to the solution. Uh, even if you solve the problem, you should look at the solution that you that the textbook gives you and see if there was, uh, maybe it's a better way than you came up with. Maybe that solution was more elegant. Maybe it was less elegant. Um, and so it's definitely worth, uh, in my mind, it's definitely worth trying to solve problems on your own uh, in math before you actually look up the answer. Uh, and that's as you're reading any math textbook. And I think nowadays that's a lot easier to do because you can find some phenomenal resources online. You can, for example, find um, websites with sample problems and sample tests with answers and so on and so forth. There are websites where you can ask questions about math, uh, places like Math Overflow and other sites. And so I definitely would recommend that you, uh, you try to use sites like that and try to use the, the wonderful set of resources that we now have available to us for being able to understand mathematics at a better level. And then finally, um, uh, Regardless, I mean, even if you're able to come up with a solution, or let's say you're able to you read the solution uh, in the actual textbook because you couldn't figure it out on your own, you should then cover up the solution and see if you can reproduce it afterwards. Uh, and as part of that, you may want to see if you can identify any broader strategy that we use to have to tackle the problem. For example, uh, within mathematics, you'll often find that uh, what might appear to be a very complex looking solution actually has a very simple underlying idea. And the solution might involve some additional messy details that are not difficult, but that elaborate on the idea, but that, that maybe make it, that kind of obscure the initial idea. So sometimes if you try to take a more active approach, things will just make a lot more sense. You'll find that, hey, I actually understand this very complex looking solution because it's actually not that complex. There's a simple idea and then there's some details that are messy. And I think there's a difference between something being a very complex solution and something being a messy solution. And, and I think if you are, um, cognizant of that underlying idea, um, then you can you know, really deepen your understanding. And in general, uh, you'll, under you'll figure out that actually it's just that simple underlying idea that you need to be cognizant of and everything else uh, you'll be able to figure out from that one idea or that one set of ideas. So now it, you know, it might sound from what I've described that active learning is this time-consuming uh, monstrosity. And, and you know, while it might ostensibly seem that way, it actually saves you time in the long run. Uh, the reason for that is that one is that you're studying pretty much up front, and you're spending much less time cramming later. Uh, what students often do is they'll just take notes uh, passively, and then the first time they'll open those notes up is uh, the day before the test, and then try to cram everything in, and spend a lot of time cramming, and it's just very ineffective. Uh, so it's sometimes ideas just need time to gel in your head. And the earlier you can start towards that process of building the necessary foundations, the better. So kind of study early, study often. Uh, the other thing is that in classes, oftentimes, and this is especially true of math, the stronger your understanding of the current material, um, 
will lead to a stronger understanding of subsequent material. And concepts often build upon each other. And if you um, understand something well now, it'll take you less time to arrive at an appropriate level of understanding for the next topic you look at. Stronger understanding of material today will help in future classes that build on this material as well. And this is, again, very true with mathematics. So this is something that will save you time in the long run as well. And then finally, uh, since part of the process of active learning involves identifying key points and intuition, etc., when you do come back to your notes, that, as I alluded to earlier, you'll find that you don't need to relearn everything from scratch. You can often look at the summary and that'll be enough to jog your memory, or you'll be able to look at the underlying intuition and that'll be, again, enough to help you understand something better. And again, this is something that you see oftentimes in mathematics. Um, you, you'll look at the solution of a problem and you'll, maybe you'll understand it the first time, then a couple of months later, you'll come back to it and say, oh, wait, this doesn't make any sense to me. How did they come up with this answer? If you've written the intuition down in the margins or with your notes, you'll be able to go ahead and read that intuition. That'll help you to kind of re-understand the material at a much faster rate than you were in the past. Now, actually, on a somewhat tangential note, if you ever decide that you want to go into research in mathematics or computer science or a related field, you'll find that many researchers can actually read through scientific research papers much faster by taking an active approach. And I remember watching my own thesis advisor do this very naturally, and maybe it wasn't that natural, maybe he spent many years uh, trying to build that ability up. But what he would do is he would look at a paper and rather than kind of reading it linearly as I was doing at that time from beginning to end, he would you know, first kind of figure out what problem that paper was addressing, start thinking through that problem himself and how the paper might have approached that problem, and then flip through the paper to see if it appeared to be taking the approach he had in mind. And in the process, he might uh, adjust his own mental model about what the paper was doing or what approach it might be taking um, as he was skimming through the paper or kind of flipping back and forth through it. And then along the way, he would figure out what was actually tricky about that problem. Obviously, if somebody wrote a, a scientific research paper about a problem, there must have been something about that problem that made it non-trivial or, or made it interesting. Uh, so there must have been some key insight that led to the solution. And once you would identify what that tricky part of the problem was, you could then go ahead and say, look, okay, what's the actual key insight in this paper? And drill down into that key insight, focusing on that very specific and very critical part of the paper. And this process was highly nonlinear, and he would kind of be flipping back and forth through the paper as he did this. But he could effectively read the paper in far, far less time than it would take anybody to go through it linearly. Uh, and moreover, I think he got a deeper understanding out of it. Now, not every paper can be understood so quickly and so readily, and you may need to um, maybe more carefully work through the details to really check that every I is dotted and every T is crossed. But with this type of method, you can at least get a great understanding very rapidly. And, and again, this requires a lot of effort and practice before you can get to that point where you can read papers that quickly by flipping through them back and forth. But it goes to show that um, a lot of phenomenal learners uh, don't take a linear approach to learning. They're constantly interacting with the information they're presented with. And in the process of that interaction, they're not only able to get, engage at a deeper level, but they're able to do so in a way that will retain that information uh, in the long run and, and really help with, uh, with future cognition and future ability in that, in that subject matter. So uh, I'm going to end on that note, and I look forward to making some more videos for you on study skills and learning skills. Thanks a lot, and I will see you in a future video.